Welcome, one and all, to another episode of The Damage War with me, John Derula, and joining us, Mondale Robinson, founder of the Black Male Voter Project, mayor of Enfield, North Carolina. Glad to have you back on the show. It's good to be back, Daddy Dragon. <laughs> That's technically <laughs> true. She's not far away, and I wish I was with her right now. But um, but very glad to have you back, back stateside after your uh, sojourn abroad. Um, we got a lot of news to talk about today, so you picked a good day to be on the show. Awesome. Uh, and if you are uh, tuning in live, please hit the like button if that's a thing that you can do. You can share the stream in a variety of different ways. Um, you could even share it on Twitter so that Twitter will not just be anti-Semitism and misinformation. Balance it out a little bit. Feel free to do that. But anyway, through the course of this show, we're going to be talking about some huge news, including uh, the future for George Santos. Some uh, significant vicious misinformation being spread about a ceasefire protest that happened in Washington DC uh, just yesterday. And Elon Musk, like, I was gonna say like, like taking the mask off, but the mask isn't on, but still he finds a way to get worse. So a lot to talk about, and that's just in the first hour. Coming up in the aftermath, we've got some crazy news on uh, climate change. We've got the return of Meanwhile In including what seems to be a reboot of Suits in Kenya. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Everyone stay tuned for that. Uh, and with all that said, why don't we jump into our first story. Down goes Santos, sort of eventually. George Santos is leaving, but not on the timeline that I or I think most people would choose. All of this is coming out in the immediate aftermath of the release of the House Ethics Committee report on his behavior and uh, he responded to it on Twitter. And it took him a while to make the only point that really mattered. But here's what he had to say in response to this damning evidence, which we're gonna break down for you. If there was a single ounce of ethics in the ethics committee, they would not have released this biased report. The committee went to extraordinary lengths to smear myself and my legal team about me not being forthcoming. My legal bills suggest otherwise. And you can trust anything he says about finances, obviously. It's a disgusting politicized smear that shows the depths of how low our federal government has sunk. Everyone who participated in this grave miscarriage of justice should all be ashamed of themselves. And I get what he's doing here. He's doing the Trump thing of implying that any investigation is obviously biased and you shouldn't pay attention uh, to it. Uh, note though for George Santos, if you're trying to win over the Trump people with this sort of narrative, your vocabulary is way too good. <laughs> you gotta dial it back a little bit, use more caps lock, and then you might have them. But anyway, he goes on to say that we need a constitutional convention to save him, I guess, like something, something debt, something, something southern border, all issues that he very much cares about and is working very hard on. But none of that is particularly important. If you push past multiple paragraphs of that, because reminder, Twitter now lets you make tweets that are way too long, he eventually gets to the point. Uh, I will, however, not be seeking reelection for a second term in 2024, as my family deserves better than to be under the gun from the press all the time. And if anyone, I can agree with him, if anyone is responsible for his family potentially being too much focused on by the press, it's the press's fault. He hasn't done anything over the past few years to draw intense scrutiny on his actions. But anyway, he's leaving, not immediately, Mondale, but he is eventually going to be going. This doesn't necessarily change too much since it looked like he was gonna have a pretty hard path to beating you know, Republican challengers in the primary, let alone winning a general election. And honestly, as much as I do wanna see him gone, I really wanted to see him lose on his way out. So I feel like this is his last insult to us as he leaves the door, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. Him not having to run for re-election is another grift by this guy. I feel dirty when I found out he was not going to run for re-election. We are owed your defeat. I need to believe the people of that district would never, as they, as the, like you said, the mask are off with you, never re-elect him. But the problem is, here's the problem: this 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 person talking about their family under uh, intense scrutiny is absolutely ridiculous. I have not seen anybody scrutinize his family. It is him. That's being scrutinized. And maybe that brings pain to his family. Well, buddy, you kind of deserve it. I mean, let's be clear here. George Santos is nothing more than the, in, the, the embodiment of everything that is this idea that we could do base politics and it's enough just rallying people up based off of emotions. Yeah, I don't 
uh, we've we've talked about George Santos, I think, uh, eighty seven times, and <laughs> I I don't know anything about his family. I don't think. There's a lot of names sort of floating around George Santos, but I'm pretty sure all of those are alter egos for George Santos. I don't think there are any other human beings related to him. So it's just, it's what they always do when they finally step down. But but it is like, it's good that he is going to be, that he's not gonna be in Congress anymore. But I really do feel sort of robbed. So I, I wanna do a sort of twist on something else that's happening out there. I know that there's a lot of people who are signing petitions and trying to do like, you know, a legal process to get Trump uh, barred from the ballot in multiple states. I want to start a petition to force him to be on the ballot. George Santos should be legally forced to run for election so he can get his ass kicked. That's what I want. Sign my petition. But anyway, um, you you mentioned that this is sort of a grift. I think it's 100% that. This way he can say, I never lost. I never lost, and and because I announced that I was stepping down, they're probably not going to investigate, you know, the, on the political side anymore. It just takes some of the pressure off him and lets him turn to whatever ridiculous thing comes next in his career. That that's sort of what I feel is coming. Yeah, I mean, and you're absolutely right. And we also should mention that him not running for re-election still gives us a year of this guy grifting and making connections to make money off of the United States government and taxpayers. That's exactly what this is about. You said it, you hit it right on the head when you said he's trying to tamp down this ethics investigation or see to making sure it don't go any further than what it already has exposed on him. Another lie, another group of lies about him uh, that could hurt him, you know, provincially making money for the next 11 months or so. And then he'll do whatever he does, consult for Trump or be, join Trump's administration if he wins, who knows? Maybe, maybe, or you know, maybe he won't run for re-election, but maybe he'll run for election under a different name. Maybe, uh -huh. I don't know. Anyway, George Sand, uh -huh. and you're right, another year, another year where like there are so many people in that district that deserve representation and they will not get it, they won't get it. Um, I saw a comment, I, I apologize, I didn't see who sent it, but that, um. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect that he would lose re-election. After all, Bober got re-elected, and that is true. But Bobert is bad in a much more typical way for a public. Like George Santos is such an outlier for his behavior that I have to believe that he would lose. Why don't we jump um, into what was actually found? The House Ethics Committee uh, just earlier today released its uh, long anticipated report, their exhaustive survey of the life and crimes of George Santos. And they found that there is substantial evidence that he violated federal criminal laws. So they have, after all this time, caught up to all of us circa 18 months ago or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, yes, they believe that he did break the law. And uh, the report is up. You can go see it if you want. I'm gonna sort of read a few excerpts that I thought were fun. Uh, they say there's a complex web of unlawful activity involving his campaign, personal and business finances. He sought to fraudulently exploit every aspect of his house candidacy for his own personal financial profit and will most likely continue to do that. He blatantly stole from his campaign. He deceived donors into providing what they thought were contributions to his campaign, but were in fact payments for his personal benefit. He reported fictitious loans to his political committees, and he sustained all of this through a constant series of lies to his constituents, donors, and staff about his background and experience. That those are sort of the top lines of the most important substantive crimes that he committed. But coming out of this, if you see anything about this report, what you're probably going to see is that he used the money to pay for, I think there was some clothing, but also OnlyFans expenses. <laughs> Dude, pay your own OnlyFans. Like I mean, that's on you. That's the thing that you like. And so I'm a little bit uh, upset about this. I can only imagine how Ben Shapiro feels about this. But uh, Mondale, what do you think about this report? Well, what you don't know is he actually paid to see Ben Shapiro on OnlyFans. No, I'm just joking. Oh my God. I'm, I'm just joking. Um, listen, Botox. He also paid for Botox. But can't Botox, be. yes. So it's, it's unbelievable. This is unbelievable. But I, I, I you said something um, that's kind of funny to me. That I, you know, the, the, the that, that's. Funny in the most scariest way possible, John. And that funny, scary thing is that Bobert is normal in this Republican mm -hmm. era that we find ourselves in, right? She's not the extreme. This is. It is unbelievable. You have to be guilty of this 
to be considered extreme or an outlier for this Republican Party. We thought the Tea Party was nuts when they came in. We thought and there's no way in hell this could be a part of the governing uh, complex that is America. Now we have this. I don't. I don't know what's next if MTG and Bobert and the rest of those clowns over there are are the new norm for Republican Party. That also means that mm. this dysfunction is baked into democracy as we know it from here going forward until Donald Trump get rid of democracy and make himself, uh, you know, the authoritarian that runs yeah. America. Yeah, you're right. I uh, it's just been such a weird ride with this guy and and. And these latest details are so weird. Like in particular, the, the Botox thing. Like he's a clown, but he doesn't seem like he needs Botox. He's a he's a young guy. He seems to have pretty good skin. I don't know what the Botox is for. And and on the OnlyFans, just it's a reminder of how irresponsible he is that he would expect that we should pay for that. Just do what every responsible adult does, which is every paycheck you set aside 10% that goes to OnlyFans. Like you just don't even think about it. Just have it automatically deducted. But anyway. He's um he's gonna stick around for another year. It is still possible that he could be expelled, that we will not have to wait. And that at least would be that black mark on his uh I guess his ledger. Um, if you would be able to see it amongst all the other black marks. So that is possible. Representative Robert Garcia is going to be submitting a privilege resolution to expel him. That'll be coming up in just a couple of weeks. He's, he previously did one of the other ones that regrettably failed. And wouldn't it have looked great? To get out ahead of this sort of report as the Republicans in Congress and show that you actually care about this. Now they're the ones who voted to keep him, the guy who committed all these crimes and spent taxpayer dollars on Botox and OnlyFans or whatever. And it is a privilege resolution, so there will be a vote on it, but that's still no guarantee that they're going to expel him. So I don't know, maybe we could get a little poll going on whether people think he's gonna make it to election day. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, listen, let's be let's be clear, John. You are thinking like a logical person. That logic does not exist in the Republican Party. Actually, it's enough to get you barred faster than it would get him expelled. He's not going anywhere. I, I promise you, he's not going anywhere because they are committed to power at any cost. Yeah. And they need that vote. They can't afford to allow uh someone else to come in that have, that's more moderate from that district, which would actually look more like that district. So I think well, I think what we're gonna see is we're gonna let him saying that he's not gonna run for re-election uh may be enough to carry him through the next election. Here's what's scary though. Here's what I believe. I'm not past this guy saying he's not gonna run for re-election and then just do. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't even really think about that. He is a liar. We should not forget that. Ah, oh, that's a good point. Um, and, and everyone, in terms of the stakes, just I'm just gonna throw this out to, to end this segment. Um, coming up in 2024, Joe Biden is polling lower than Trump, which is an absolute disaster. On the Senate side, the Democrats have like an apocalyptic map of seats that they have to defend, and that's looking really bad. So the future of the House, super important if you want any checks and balances whatsoever. The Republicans currently have a very narrow lead. These sorts of things, like if George Santos is on the ballot or not, can be super important for if the, if the Republicans get to like maybe do everything that they want over the next four years. So all of this matters, we'll be tracking it. That's gonna be it for this segment though. There is so much more to talk about, including the protests outside of the DNC that happened yesterday and what the hell Elon Musk has gotten up to. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Okay, everybody, if you're just joining us now, please hit that like button because we're going to dive into some big news. <clears throat> there was a big protest outside of the DNC yesterday in DC calling for a ceasefire. And exactly what the nature of that protest was really depends on who you talk to because there's a lot of a uh, lot of Republicans, a lot of Democrats, remember the media that are working overtime to convince you that this group of protesters fighting for a ceasefire between Hamas and Palestine were violent, that they were out of control, that they were trying to break into a building and they are not going to allow a complete lack of evidence of any of that to get in their way. And I'm gonna give you an example of this, but there's so much out there. Here's a little bit of Fox and Friends. 
They say that they just showed up peacefully linked arms in front of the entrance to the DNC and that the police just started to attack them. As you can see from the video and from Congressman Brad Sherman, a Democrat, who says that the protesters attacked the police and pepper sprayed them even. So there's two sides to this story, but the video, I think, tells uh, the facts. Yeah, I think the video tells the facts too. Are you on mushrooms? They say they just locked arms and got attacked, but others say they pepper sprayed. The video you are literally talking over shows them locking arms and being attacked by the cops, or at least roughed up by the cops. It does not show, and I watched that video so many times, any violence from a protester towards a member of the police. It shows people engaging in, yes, perhaps illegal civil disobedience. But the fact that it is disobedient or that it is illegal does not by its very nature make it violent. And you just playing video that doesn't show what you're saying over and over again is never going to make it violent. We've got a lot more, but I can see how worked up you are, Mondale. What do you think? What, in, John, how is, how are you gonna say and show a video proving exactly you're wrong and, and just do it with a straight face? Also, those police officers are attacking them. Let me explain what I'm, I've, I've been arrested more than 56 times for protesting, right? Well, wow. Some of them for protesting. <laughs> but <laughs> but what, what police officers know is once you lock arm and then they start rocking back and forth, they're inflicting some serious pains on people joints, especially those who are smaller or in the middle. You have all this force of going back and forth and you see the officers doing it in, 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 in uh, like not being sync. That you're creating some serious pressure on both sides of those arms, trying to break the links of those chains. That is absolutely some type of form of violence. Yes, civil disobedience is uh, is like what I guess the world call it illegal, but it's also it has a rich history in this country. We were being the Tea Party, not the one that we were just talking about, but the Tea Party that got us free from Europe was civil disobedience. So this is this is it is absolutely disgusting when we turn people in this conversation into what what they're doing with this video and what they were saying. It's and and for Democrats to keep missing the writing on the wall, one about the ceasefire, but also about what people feel about this is gonna be the end of them for next year. That red wave they were looking for in 2022 will drown them in 2024. Another, another thing to worry about, but yeah, I it's, it, the, like everybody watching this, you saw the video. We can play it again if you want. We've got it queued up. It doesn't show what they're saying. He's literally talking over it. And the thing that, God, it just makes my blood boil is I know there's so many people watching the original broadcast of that, like, yeah, that's them being violent. Look at them roughing up those cops. Look at that. And oh, by the way, all of those Republicans watching that are like, yeah, it's bad to rough up cops. It's bad to attack cops. They didn't care at all on January 6th. But all of a sudden, the non roughing up of the cops is the worst thing you could possibly do. So look, Fox and Friends is spreading misinformation, but there's a lot of people working on that side. Congressman Brad Sherman, a Democrat, says was just evacuated from the DNC after pro terrorist anti Israel protesters grew violent pepper spraying police officers and attempting to break into the building. There's no evidence of pepper spraying, no evidence of them breaking into the building. They were blocking the exits, which you're not supposed to do, that is true. That does not mean that they were breaking in. Thankful to the police officers who stopped them and for helping me and my colleagues get out safely. If they had actually been trying to break down the doors and assault Congress people, I feel safe in saying we would be against that since we demonstrated that in the wake of January 6th. It doesn't show that though. And it's a bipartisan thing. You got Marco Rubio saying all US House buildings locked down while pro Hamas rioters trying to storm the offices of the Democratic National Committee. The US Capitol Police are saying that six officers were treated for injuries, ranging from minor cuts to being pepper sprayed to being punched. Look, I cannot say that in that big scrum that nobody threw a punch, but it clearly, all of the video evidence shows that whatever violence there was, the overwhelming majority of it was police officers trying to break up the protest. And the only evidence so far, and you can see in this picture that the Justice Democrats put out of pepper spraying is from the police. And I have a crazy theory, maybe I'm a kook, let me know if you think I am. I think they pepper sprayed some people and some of it wafted back over them. And then all of a sudden we got pepper sprayed too. You guys are the ones with the pepper spray, maybe look in the mirror.
My yeah, John, John, I think also people are forgetting that pepper spray does not just stay where you pointed at. It's in the air, wind is blowing, everybody was affected by it. it is, this is absolutely ludicrous. People don't, what people don't understand is when we do civil disobedience, uh, there's there's plenty of steps, plenty of protests, legal protests, legal verbs, observers. And the first thing you were taught is not, not to be violent with the police officers. So it's, 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 it goes against the entire purpose of standing up for the ceasefire that they're calling for. So this is, this is, this is baloney. This is, this is weak from the Democrats that are siding with this. But what do we expect? 20, 20, 22 of these people actually voted to censor Rashid Tlaib. Right. So I'm, I'm not surprised at all that we're getting this from some of her colleagues, but it is, it is, it's, it is telling. Yeah. That Republicans go down on lies for their followers, for their supporters, and Democrats can't even tell the truth about theirs. Yeah, yeah, no, you're you're 100 percent right. Uh, like I, I would just like a little bit of truth to be told about that. I mean, there's people trying. Uh, Dave Weigel, journalist, was there. He put up video. He's trying against all odds to get people to accept what actually happened. They said it was a very weird night. Many people sending me incorrect claims from people who weren't at the protest to refute the photos and videos I took at the protest. He was getting tweets from people saying, yeah, you think you know what happened there? Well, I have first-hand accounts. He's a first-hand account. His hands were there. That's what it means. Um, and so again, and I just want to briefly point out, being for a ceasefire does not mean that you're a pro-terrorist or pro-Hamas. That's not actually how it works. It also doesn't mean that you're anti-Israel. And as I say, so I've said so many times, and I'm going to keep saying it: when somebody uses the term "pro" or "anti" an entire country, they think you are an idiot. They think you are a dumb donkey that they can manipulate into believing their propaganda by implying that you having a view on a military tactic or a political strategy means that you are for or against an entire country, a nation, a people, a religion. That is not how it works. Unless the people saying that believe that Israel is one thing and all Israelis are one thing and they all believe the exact same thing and no dissent is allowed because they're not people, they're robots. That is an incredibly offensive thing to think and it's just as dumb now as it was back in 2003 when they were telling us that if you were against the invasion of Iraq, you were anti America. That is not how it works. It's propaganda. Don't get affected by it. Hmm, that's powerful, John. It's powerful. And this is why I still eat French fries and not freedom fries. Yes. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> uh, by the way, I want to read a statement from uh, Eva uh, uh, Borgwart, uh, if not now, national spokesperson, because they were uh, involved in the protest, saying, as protesters engaged in a moral act of nonviolent civil disobedience outside of the building, police charged at protesters and attacked them without giving any warning or order to disperse. The police pepper sprayed us, pulled them by the hair, and throwing them down the stairs. That is actually on the extended video, resulting in over 90 injuries to protesters. Goes on to say, we are horrified to see elected officials like Brad Sherman, Marco Rubio, and Speaker Mike Johnson spread misinformation and accuse Jewish activists of being anti Semitic, pro Hamas, especially since many of our members are grieving Israeli loved ones who were killed on October 7th. It is offensive, hurtful, and dangerous. These leaders should apologize and retract their dangerous and hurtful statements. I do not expect that that is going to happen. Um, but while we wait, I suppose you can go to ceasefiretoday.com for a variety of different ways that you can, you know, have your voice be heard on this topic. Um, these protests are certainly a way. There's probably protests near you. Feel free to participate in them, but there's other ways as well. Bondale, they just lie. They just lie. They just lie. And, hate and, and what happens, John, in that in those lies is we're we're gonna eliminate, we're gonna otherize those 90 people who are actually injured. Right. Yeah. That, that that will never be mainstream. That would not be the conversation. People were and also there should have been warnings. You don't just walk up to people and grab people and snatch them, snatch them by hair. All of this is violent. And I bet you there are videos to show and support this. The problem with this is um, this country does not care about facts or what what you can support. Yeah. It goes by what people are feeling at this moment. And, and here's here's a tragedy that no one is talking about. There's so many people uh, as just like, these are people who are Israeli uh, Jewish people out here protesting and calling for a ceasefire. And they were being attacked by police officers and also being sent there pro Hamas, just as you just said. This idea that you can't exist in a different space. You have to support Benjamin Netanyahu's government, who the people of Israel were already pissed off at anyway and yeah. about to do away with before October 7th. Now, if you criticize the same guy, the same government, Bibi's government, then you have a problem. You are anti-Semitic. And that is not fair to, to, to Israelis, one, 
those on how they feel differently than BB's government, and two, those who are, are like you said, diverse in thinking about all of the politics of this government uh, in general, man. And I yeah. think I, I think the biggest part about this is uh, America sitting silent, uh, uh, the, the president of the United States refusing to say ceasefire is necessary. Uh, as we see, as we see thousands and thousands of people, it takes 45 minutes, not me and my stumbling uh, Arabic language. It takes 45 minutes for a well-spoken Arabic person to say every child's name that died before their first birthday. That's how many kids have died. It would take 45 minutes to sit and read those names. That's how many kids under the age of one have died. And it is ridiculous that we can't even say that it's time out. We need a time out, a humanity time out to address what's happening in, in Gaza right now. That's a great point. And, uh, you know, because things aren't changing, is it going to be 46 minutes in a couple of days, 47 minutes, 48 minutes? The clock is ticking. Um, and you're right, Joe Biden won't do it. He's not the only one. Look, we, we we criticized Bernie Sanders for not being willing to use that language. There are those who have. I think there's a group of at least 24 uh, Congress people, members of the squad, and others who have pushed for it. Very quickly, I want to respond to a couple more little things that came up in that Fox and Friends interview that really angered me. So why don't we just jump right into this second video? They should do a split screen. They should show the rally with 300,000 people two days earlier yeah. versus 100 people uh, last night where these are the two different sides. People should make a choice. Which side do you want? And there's a bit of irony worth pointing out, I think, too, because they're demanding a ceasefire while engaging in violence. First of all, no, they're not. Again, the video that you showed does not show that. But even if they punched a cop, the idea that, oh, you say you don't want thousands of civilians to be slaughtered by bombs dropped by planes, and yet you punch someone, mm, seems hypocritical to me. What a privileged position to use there. But to then to 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 make this parallel with the the massive um, the pro Israeli war effort um, protest that or get rally I guess that happened, and to say that one was huge and nonviolent and this was violent again it wasn't. But the idea that the cops didn't clash with those protesters earlier, those pro, those pro, those ralliers were in favor of what the governments were doing. They're in favor of the US government's position. They're in favor of the Israeli government's position. How weird that police didn't have as much of a problem with them than the ones who were challenging the status quo. It's just a such, like I have to assume that this person is pretending to be this dumb. But that said, I wanna play one more clip and then we'll have a little conversation. Let's jump into this. They have no That's idea. True. And all they have to do is look at the video of the IDF going in there, uh, bringing in incubators, uh, bringing in gas, uh, bringing in uh, supplies for hospitals while pulling out uh, M16 rifles, uh, uh, RPG, uh, uh, RPGs. And you got to see the armaments in these hospitals. They have to go into those cities in order to eradicate Hamas from this planet. We, they have no choice. It is just, it's just idiotic and ignorant to think that Israel is the problem here. Well, we got to stop calling these protests peaceful. You can't obstruct the entry into a private mm -hmm. business. You just can't do that. You can't punch you can't, it. That's up. not peaceful. You can't pe pepper spray cops and think that it's okay. So they went smoothly from a guy saying that, let's say the, the IDF pulling out the guns is totally authentic or whatever. Uh, so they have no choice. They have no choice. You dumb college students, you're simplistic thinkers. I'm a serious adult wearing a tie. They found guns, so obviously they need to bomb hospitals, you idiot. Uh, to a guy saying, if you block the doorway of a building, that's not peaceful. So there are forms of war that they're against. The arms locking variety, the dropping the bombs variety, that's what are you gonna do? There's no choice, you gotta annihilate these things. But if you protest, that's an act of war. And again, the, the people watching that just eat it up, Mondale. Yeah, and I, and I think you know this. This is a this is this is Donald Trump's news station, right? I mean, like this idea we're going to say three hundred thousand people showed up and there were no problems in in D.C. First of all, that number is been told. People are saying it's it's exaggerated, right? Tens of thousands of people showed up. Regardless, the point is the point that we're trying to make. I think is the majority of people support Israel. 
And, and I think they, they're going back to exactly what you were saying. This is not about whether you support Israel or Gaza or, or Palestinians. This is about this military, uh, this military move by this government, Benjamin Netanyahu's government needs to stop for, for, hum, for humanity's sake. That's it. And then they're trying to push a narrative that there's no need to stop because Israelis is bringing in generators, which they're not the Israeli government is not bringing in. They're they're doing polls is so other people can do humanity work or humanitarian work, but they're not doing that. The, the IDF is not doing that. This is this is it's full of lies. And then and then they just spower into this idea that somebody punched the police. That somebody, I am a black man. Every time a police officer has wanted me to be locked up, I was locked up. Whether it was for resisting arrest for saying no to that person, whether it was for looking at him wrong or saying something slick back to him because they said something slick to me. This idea that police got punched I, is, is more than fanciful. What probably happened was they were snatching somebody around and somebody got somebody's body part might have touched the police officer while they were getting snatched and thrown around. There's yeah. no there's no humanity in what what we just watched on Fox News. These people don't care about facts. They don't care about other they don't care about the ones that they've other, whether that's LGBTQI people, whether that's in this case, people from Palestine. This man said, sitting in that chair comfortably outside, beside four other adults, Israel has no other choice but to go in here and eradicate these people. Basically, what you're saying, anything or anybody, and they they prefer to say thing, anything that is destroyed, including human life, trying to eradicate. Uh, Hamas is verified or justified just because Hamas needs to be eradicated. The problem with that is babies are dying. Individuals who had nothing to do with that government, Hamas, are dying. We are sitting silent in this country. We are responsible for it as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our our literal weapons are being used in a lot of cases. Um, yeah, there were, there were 3,700 people. Like, I, I believe it was 700 patients, 3,000 people sheltering in the hospital. Um, I don't know. Maybe they did bring generators, generators or whatever. Uh, considering the scrutiny now that the media is putting on them, it would probably be a good idea, at least for PR. Um, but let me ask everyone in the audience a question. Um, does that make everything okay? A bomb is dropped. Your daughter is blown to bits, but they bring a generator later. So I guess we're good. Like, who actually believes that? If that, that was Kilmeade, okay, Kilmeade. Um, so terrorists commit an attack, and then they uh, they go and they hide in your neighborhood, uh, and they're hiding there, and we don't know where they are, and we got to get them because they might do another attack. Uh, so the U.S. government starts bombing your neighborhood. They have to. Terrorists are in your neighborhood, and you complaining about the fact that you and your family are being killed seems really gauche, considering that we have no choice. We have to get them. Like we're asking the most basic hypotheticals. What if it was happening to you? Would you think that's acceptable? And literally no one would say that it was, but it's not happening to them. It's happening to other people, other people that they are predisposed historically to not give a damn about. It is very easy to be okay with horrific crimes being committed against those that you didn't care about anyway. I wanna give people just a couple of updates of what's actually happening over there. Fairly big developments in the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Hamas has apparently agreed to a tentative deal to free dozens of hostages. That deal is apparently now being considered by the Israeli government. It would release at least 50 women and children among the about 240 that have been held now for quite a few weeks. In exchange for the hostages, Israel would have to agree to a three to five day pause in place in the fighting. Increased humanitarian aid to Gaza and the release of an unspecified number of women and children held in Israeli prisons. This is not a case where they're they're trying to get, you know, like captured Hamas fighters back or anything like that. It'd be women and children for women and children. That is a thing that is now being considered. And uh, diplomats from another number of countries, including Gulf nations and the United States, are involved um, in those negotiations. So that would obviously still leave many of the hostages, uh, you know, not being returned. 50 is a lot. I'm not a diplomat. I don't, I, it's hard for me, Mondale, to judge whether Israel has any chance of agreeing to this, but it's a lot of families who I'm sure are like fingers crossed hoping that they do. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, listen, uh, I mean, if, 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 if people are saying there should be no ceasefire without hostage release, I think this, this, this should 
a damn well go a long way making Israel at least listen to what what is what is what is being proposed. I, I am I'm confused by all of this honestly, John. And my confusion is not about um the politics of it, right? My confusion is why America is so silent on what's going on over there when we have so much influence. We give so many resources to that country um so as to 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 be good allies to Israel. And I don't think anyone is 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 well, some people are questioning that. I'm, that's not my question here. Here's my question. Hamas membership pre-December, uh, uh, right, of this year, or I'm sorry, November of this year, was 10, 10 to 12, 20,000. We've, Israel, and I keep saying we in Israel because the two are inseparable, have already killed over 13,000 people. If you've killed more than what their membership is and it wasn't their membership, what is your end goal? Well, I, I'm confused by this. You've killed 13, almost 13,000 innocent people. What is your end goal? Where do we stop at? Because if it takes you 10,000 to kill, if it, it takes you 13,000 individuals to kill a few hundred of Hamas, the numbers extrapolated means you got to wipe out everybody in Gaza to get to the full membership. Is that what we're okay with? By not demanding a ceasefire? So, I mean, the, I, I, I'm, I'm super frustrated with who and what Hamas is for sure. Everybody who cares about humanity is, but that does not address the fact that uh, people, the size of all of Hamas have been murdered, even though they had nothing to do with that organization. And I think this hostage thing on the Hamas side is still a distraction and they're playing politics. A ceasefire is what we need, regardless of what Israel government and also Hamas have going on mm -hmm. and what they're negotiating. Period. And if we were serious, if we were being serious about putting an end to what Hamas represent, there'd be some real conversations with some of our allies outside of Gaza, i.e. Qatar and also Saudi Arabia, about why they're housing the real leadership of Hamas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and maybe, maybe that is a part of some of these negotiations going on behind the scenes, but it's a great point. And uh, your point about, you know, the, the number that have been killed and questioning how many need to be. I would love to hear all of these people sitting on their shows and advocating for the violence to continue. How how is there a line? Is it twenty thousand civilians? Is it twenty thousand kids? Is it twenty percent of all of those who live in Gaza? Where is the line, if any, that you are drawing on when it finally becomes unacceptable the war strategy that's being pursued? And in terms of that strategy, very quickly to close out this segment. Israel has recently begun dropping leaflets in some of the towns in Gaza, in southern Gaza, warning people to flee there. And when last week we talked about the humanitarian pauses to open up roadways so that people in the north could flee to the south, we asked, I think a fairly obvious question is, well, so what happens when the war goes to the south? And I have a question I would like to ask now. It's the same one. What's going to happen? Now, there are two options that they've, they've alluded to. Uh, and by the way, very clear that this is going to encapsulate all of Gaza. So the defense minister of Israel said the ground operation is going to include both the north and the south. We will strike Hamas wherever it is, which it means in reality, we will strike Gaza wherever we want. And yeah, maybe maybe Hamas will be hurt by it. And uh, maybe you'll have civilian losses in the south like you have in the north. Um, Netanyahu said there is no place in Gaza that we will no, not reach. There is no hiding, no shelter, no refuge for the murderers of Hamas or the civilians because they have even less ability to protect themselves. But the two solutions are tent camps and sending mass quantities of Gazans to live in Egypt. Those are the two plans. Neither of those is acceptable, neither of those should be legal. Um, but the proposed humanitarian area where they would set up these tent camps, uh, Muasi, is relatively small, underdeveloped, cannot support hundreds of thousands of people right now, let alone during the winter. Um, and of course, you know, as has been talked about a lot throughout this week, uh, reminding a lot of people of the Nakba, you should do your research. By the way, everyone should check out John Oliver's uh, episode this last week on uh, the leadership of uh, Hamas and Israel. It just it gives a lot of great history, uh, including in this. Um, you, th these camps are going to 
first of all, there's no reason that we believe that the camps themselves won't be targeted. Refugee camps in the north already have been. So is that really shelter? It remains to be seen. How many people will die because of the lack of infrastructure, the lack of medicine, the lack of electricity once the winter sets in? And Egypt has already said that they do not want masses of refugees being moved into their territory. And like to push for that as a strategy, we would not find that to be acceptable in any other international relations scenario where you say that population, if you want to be safe, guess you got to go live in another country for some period of time. We'll we'll see about maybe letting you back in at some point. These are not acceptable solutions, and I really hope that diplomacy is you know being pursued to stop this. But what do you think? Yeah, I mean, like, listen, I, I, this is not diplomacy, right? I mean, this is this is this is this is lazy diplomacy at best, and it's 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 anti-human. Uh, really, it is this uh, this idea that we're telling people go to go to the south. With when there's no infrastructure already, uh, because it's been destroyed by massive bombs, right? Massive bombing, massive, uh, military, uh, operations. And then when you get there, we're just going to bomb there too. So wherever you go, we're just going to keep moving you around, putting you in spaces where we can bomb you more. Um, and I, I don't think I, I'm confused. And I, I really think that's a, that's a powerful question that you, you propose. What, what is the, what line, what, what is too far, right? Because Benjamin Yao said, "There's nowhere they, 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 these people can hide," but it seems that it is a place because you've not you've not been reporting mass killing of Hamas troops. Hamas soldiers aren't the ones that are being murdered. It's regular civilians. These are your neighbors. Think about them as your neighbors. The oh, look out your window right now, everybody watching this show. Look out your window and look at the house to the left and the right, and imagine ten percent of your neighborhood or the entire neighborhood just gone. And you've been told to go south or wherever you are just to be bombed and to go back north to do it, to have it happen again. And now we need you to go to the next state over if it was a different country. It makes no sense. This is beyond ridiculous, but it's also the reality that these Gazans are living in. And I, and I, I, I'm, I'm extremely saddened that we are, we are proposing this as what democracy or diplomacy can present as an option. Yeah. Netanyahu needs to be stopped. His government needs to be stopped. And and then people, and this is not even a quiet chant. It's not just here in America, around this country. I was on the train in France this past weekend and people were lining up at eight o'clock in the morning for a massive, massive uh, pro-Palestine, pro-ceasefire uh, uh, protest. And I think we just gotta be serious about this and, and, and I make and require more of those that are elected and not allow people to otherwise innocent folk when we're talking about them. If we are to never forget 9-11, Palestine has just suffered in less than a month, three 9-11s. Yeah. Three. Devastating. We'll see. We'll see. I Look, maybe the, the international reaction to this expansion in the South will be harsh and maybe they'll change the strategy right now like me as a non I'm not you know a military expert or anything like that and it's been a long time since I was in grad school studying stuff like this but it feels like it feels like hurting it feels like hurting people to the south and then eventually to Egypt and hey maybe we've solved a bit of a problem in that way that's what it feels like to me but I would love to be proven wrong anyway with that said we do need to take a break lots more to get to don't go anywhere Man, the hour is passing by fast. Apologies to the producers, but we're going to jump right back into it. Okay. <clears throat> Elon Musk, who is in control of Twitter still and is still ostensibly the richest man in the world, responded to a rando on Twitter posting an anti-Semitic comment and said it was the, ab- the actual truth. Here's the comment from the artist formerly known as Eric. It says, okay. Jewish communities have been pushing the exact kind of dialectical hatred against whites that they claim to want people to stop using against them. They claim. So if you don't want anti-Semitism, you're lying about it. Uh, I'm deeply disinterested in giving the tiniest S now about Western Jewish populations coming to the disturbing realization that those hordes of minorities that support flooding their country don't exactly like them too much. You want truth said to your face, there it is. There is a lot going on in that. I mean, deep, deep anti-Semitism, racism as well. There's a lot of stuff in there, none of it good. And then Elon Musk replies, 
you have said the actual truth. And I want to be very clear about this. There is no one who could have posted that anti Semitic screed and have it be reasonable that the CEO of that social media platform, the richest man in the world, would agree with it. But doesn't it seem a little bit weirder when you find out that this is literally just some random person with like 3,800 followers? This isn't even like a right wing grifter that he's trying to endear himself to or a Republican presidential candidate spreading casual anti Semitism. How did he even find that? Is he literally just searching for anti Semitism to agree with on his platform? But regardless, that's what he did. And he's going to try to finesse it a little bit after the fact. But that is what he said. That stuff about Jewish people hate white people and attack them and then pretend to care about anti Semitism, but apparently they don't actually. That is the actual truth. And we're supposed to have a debate about what sort of person Elon Musk is, what his politics is, and what he's done to Twitter. Mondale, what are your thoughts? I mean, listen, this is this is traditional neo Nazi KKK language. And Elon Musk just co-signed it. As you said, the richest man in the world just co-signed. And what I understand about racism or any ism is, uh, listen, you don't have to always be or it's not a permanent state to be racist. You move in and out of it with your actions. This was an anti-Semitic moment for Elon Musk. And I don't know what his permanent state, permanent state is, but this right here, you can't argue uh, you can't argue, argue it any other way. I'm absolutely disgusted that this person who says his platform is more about inclusivity than I'm ever seeing uh, from him or the people that he chooses to repost and hang around. This is a disgusting point, man. Uh, him at the border was disgusting. This is next level disgusting. I, I was gone for a few months. So I didn't even see the thing with the border. I'm I'm worried to find out what happened, but he, he has. Yeah. He put on a he put on a cowboy hat, John. Went down there with a bunch of conservatives and act as if he yeah. It was it was absolutely disgusting, and it's it's one of those things where brown people are leaving. We don't even understand our impact on what we do. Brown people, our neighbors to the south, are running to this country because of situations that we even had a hand in or exacerbated. Right? It was our policies towards them to the south that created these hostile nations to people, and now we're telling them you don't deserve. You don't deserve uh, asylum, and if you if you're seeking it, you need to seek it in in, in Mexico yeah. somewhere. It's, it's disgusting, man. It's so it's so weird. Like you you dear viewer, if you had billions of dollars, what percentage of your day would you spend trolling social media for the words of the most hateful idiots in the world? And that's what he does with his time. He could be like trying to figure out how to solve some of the apparently glaring issues with the cyber truck. No, there's no time for that. We cannot fix the panel gap issue uh, because he needs to let anti Semites know that he agrees with them. Look, he goes on to say, um, well, the ADL unjustly attacks the majority of the West, despite the majority of the West supporting the Jewish people and Israel. This is because they cannot, by their own tenets, criticize the minority groups for their primary threat. It's not right. You need to stop. That is, again, that's basically just. That's supporting the same sort of replacement theory, conspiratorial nonsense from the original post. And then saying that like the, the deep racism and anti-Semitism in that, someone responds trying to say it's not fair or truthful to say that Jewish communities are attacking white people or whatever. And he says, you're right that this does not extend to all Jewish communities, but it's also not just limited. So some Jewish communities are spreading I don't even know what the theory is supposed to be about how they're attacking white people internationally, but I'm sure anti-Semites know what he's talking about. I'm sure he is playing the hits for them. It's all just, it's utter disgusting hate. And it's not like Twitter needs its CEO to be going around spreading anti-Semitism. It's got enough of that at this point because they're not doing anything to police the rampant hatred, misogyny, homophobia, Islamophobia. I could go on for a long time with this that we're seeing there. And we don't have time to dive into it. But another study from the Center for Countering Digital Hate was just put out showing that they're doing basically nothing to counter any of that, which is what made Twitter the center for hateful misinformation throughout this conflict right now. Mondale, final thoughts go to you. Yeah, man, I think you're absolutely right. And the tragedy of this is we we remember Twitter. Twitter was never perfect. 
But Twitter, when, I remember when it wasn't popular to be on Twitter, the blue check thing threw me for a loop. I'm actually one of those people, John, who can't send unlimited paragraphs, right? I refuse to pay anything. And I guess I'm going to be kicked off soon because they're going to force people to start paying. And I've been on Twitter since, you know, the year it was founded and it was beautiful. It was a bunch of nerds sharing like thoughtful <laughs> ideas. And now Twitter's something other than. And I'm, I'm disgusted and sad by what we find ourselves in the moment where you can have the richest man in the world spreading hate. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It is sad. It was never perfect, but it was it was needed. It was needed. I don't know. Threads added hashtags. I guess that's some, maybe at some point it'll. I have been gone for three months. Is Twitter dead? Is, is Threads replaced it? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, that's all the news for the first hour of the show. But there is more to come in the aftermath, everybody. So don't go anywhere. Mondale and I will be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.